Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 21 of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I will be wrapping up my conversation with Amber Rinya about the Byzantines, specifically the Macedonian and Cominian dynasties. Uh, we've gone past the Macedonians now, so this episode will focus on uh, the Cominian dynasty. Uh, we'll pick up where we left off uh, with uh, Alexius I having to, uh, being, you know, basically being surrounded by enemies on all sides. He'll turn back and face the Turks, uh, and then we'll segue into, you know, things, exciting things like currency reform. Um, before moving on to, you know, what I think people would really be interested in, which is, uh, of course, um, the relation, the, the first group Crusade and the relationship with the Byzantines and the and the West before kind of wrapping up the uh, the Cominian dynasty with the, the bloody downfall of Andronicus the first. Uh, so I hope you enjoy all that, uh, and uh, we'll pick it up uh, from where we left off. <laughs> Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. So uh, the Normans haven't been beat back. Uh, it seemed like Alexius was left with at least at that point uh, what could be called a relatively stable um, state. So what were what what was his approach to ensuring that he wasn't put in such dire straits again? All right. So so the first thing that Alexius had done after he you know had beaten off the enemies that were really pressing. So so one thing I did want to mention though is that the uh, after the defeat of the the uh, the Normans after the defeat of the Pechenegs the last one that he had to deal with was the Turks. Now the Turks were at this point getting really ambitious and they were trying to cross the Sea of Marmara. They had finally built up some ships. But Alexios formulated this again a brilliant plan to foil their their ambitions on invading the islands. So what he did was he amassed a uh, uh, what can be seen as kind of like a special forces um, that would actually you know an amphibious invasion force that would you know disrupt the the, Pesci- uh, the uh, Turks just enough so that they would um, not deal you know be a problem. Um, for the Byzantines, so these these uh, you know Marines that so to speak, um, there had been many Marines in the past before, so it was kind of a tradition for for the Byzantines, and probably wasn't too difficult for them. They were pretty um, well trained uh, in amphibious warfare, uh, especially considering the uh, invasions of the Macedonian era. So they um, they basically invaded across the the Aegean, uh, launched these night raids on various Turkish settlements, and basically put them out of commission and scared them off. So the Turks retreated to the inland, and uh, you know the Byzantines were able to buy some more time while they uh, rebuilt the armies. So after the Turks had been dealt with, Alexios finally, after beating all of the enemies around him. It, by miracle, really. I mean, if, if you consider all things, it was miracle and, and a little bit of ingenuity, but mostly miracle. He was finally able to direct his attention to finally fixing the state of the, the you know, Byzantine economy and the government. So one thing that he had done in, during the time when he was personally leading his troops, so uh, Alexios, of course, led from the front in most cases during this period, and it's interesting how he was armed, but we'll get into that when we talk about the military. But Alexios um, had appointed his mother, who was um, a very, very noted states woman. She she was apparently extremely competent uh, at running uh, various uh, government functions. Uh, he he appointed her as his essentially his uh, grand chamberlain. She ran everything in the empire while he was away. So it's really interesting to note that Alexios, in comparison to a lot of other Byzantine emperors, was a lot more, I guess, uh, he was a lot more accepting of women in government, which is, you know, really a first, you know, for, for uh, Byzantium. You know, there have only been a handful of empresses, maybe, you know, two or three in the past that had ruled in their own right, um, and they never did really well. And they were always try, you know, tried to be suppressed and put down. But under Alexios, um, women actually made a uh, pretty prominent um, impression in the government. And Maria Valania as well um, was also a noted advisor uh, in his court. So that's uh, an interesting thing. So um, under under Alexios' mother's leadership. And her name was Anna Dalasena, by the way, um, very uh, influential on Anna Comnena's life. Um, she was did a very good job of managing the empire while Alexius was away. Now, when Alexius returned and finally had stabilized his position, you know, and stabilized the borders of the empire, he finally uh, was able to turn his attention to the um, the revamping the currency. Now, he did this only after his son was born. 
So he did that when John John was born. Um, Anna was born in uh, on December first, ten eighty three. Uh, so during this kind of time of troubles when Alexius was dealing with all these enemies, um, and John was born, I think, in ten eighty seven. So he was born four years after Anna. And uh, once he was born and he was uh, proclaimed as his, um, you know, Alexios' successor, Alexios brought, you know, kind of celebrated with this revamp of the currency. And what he did was uh, something extremely controversial. Um, he took a lot of the uh, church reliquaries and all the church, um, you know, the gold that the church had, had owned, and a lot of, uh, it actually confiscated a lot of um, uh, personal belongings as well, and melted them down to form the new currency that he was going to establish, which was based on a new coin. As you know, the uh, Byzantines and the Romans, especially the late Roman Empire, based their currency on the solidus, which was a uh, gold coin, about 97% purity, gold purity, um, and had been relatively, basically stable throughout the entire history of the empire until really Romanos Argyros, who really, you know, he was the one who, who de you know, debased the currency and it continually was debased over time, um, and that had ended really the, uh, the, you know, the era of the solidus. So Alexios decided to remake this new currency called the Hyperpyron, which means like super pure or, or super refined. So um, really emphasizing the fact that, yes, we're going back to a pure coin now, none of this 2% gold content. Yes, none of this, none of this mystery metal anymore. So, and and these coins, those coins were not very pretty either. They, the uh, the the image of the emperor, which is usually pretty crisp on most of the old uh, solidi, uh, they were um they were kind of like <laughs> all you know jumbled and uh you know you couldn't really see them very well. They were you know it was just they were terrible coins. But um but by the time of uh you know around 1087, probably the late 1080s, uh, Alexios um had re redone this uh had done this currency reform and introduced the Hyperperon, as I mentioned before. And the Hyperperon was not as pure as the, uh, the Solidus, the old Solidus. It was about uh, 85 to 87 percent gold purity, which is pretty good. It's not bad. But again, it wasn't as pure as the old uh, Solidus. But as we see throughout the Comnenian era, the Hyperperon, the reform of the currency, was actually extremely successful. And even though the Solidus had been really the prime gold coin for throughout the most of the Mediterranean throughout the period, it had been copied by the by the Muslims. It had been used by the uh, various Italian trading powers, which were beginning their rise to prominence during this time. Um, so it really was, you know, the Solidus and its uh, relatives were used throughout the Mediterranean world. And in the same light, the Hyperperon also became kind of the prime coin for the for Mediterranean trade throughout the time of the, the Comnenian period, and even lasted uh, well beyond their era, although it had fallen from grace uh, by the 1300s. So that's um, that's really the history of uh, Alexios's currency reform. He also had a number of other uh, governmental reforms. One thing that Alexios tried to do uh, during his reign was that he realized that one of the dangers of rule, imperial rule, was that uh, Emperors were always vulnerable to these factions that would arise in the court, um, supported by various jealous uh, or vying um, great families. So what they wanted, what he wanted to do, was try to eliminate that issue and create it so that there was one family that ruled the the throne, that that held the throne. There was one family that ruled the government. There was one family that had its hands in everything. So there was a bit of nepotism um, in in his establishment, but it was a very sensible measure, especially considering the time that he was that you know that the empire was in and the state that it was in. Um, you know, having your own family be part of the the government and making sure that the, that your policies are established through your family was a very sensible. Could, measure. Someone you could trust. Exactly, someone you could trust, and uh, there is a there is some evidence that it was it wasn't just you know pure nepotism that it was done that it was done just because they were family members, but people who were capable of doing their job were you know in the family were put in the positions where they would be most effective. So I, I mean I've seen a lot of arguments um, in in. Uh, in a lot of the books that I've read um, from various scholars, that it was just pure nepotism, and that it was, uh, you know, it wasn't a very efficient government. But I think that the historical evidence says to the contrary that um, that it was it was quite efficient, 
and that it was effective at what it did. And, so, and of course, you know, it could be effective at some times if you have a large amount of, you know, very capable family members and less effective at other times when mm-hmm. you basically have, a, you know, kind of a confederacy of dunces that you've spawned. Yes, and that actually did come back to 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 hurt the Comnenian dynasty much later on at the very end, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But so, but yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Actually, actually, so what I want to focus on now is so the the Comnenian dynasty is fairly famous for its uh, its its military reorganization. And I think you know uh, we, when we are talking about Alexius at this point, you know, it, it we are looking at kind of the more domestic and economic reforms, but. I think in large part, those were really aimed at having um, the ability to support a much larger army and to be able to field something that could actually make some gains. So could you could you touch briefly upon um, how he kind of uh, did a, a military um, uh, rearrangement and refurbishment as well? Yes. So, so the interesting thing about Alexios is that... Um, Alexios was the one who set the stage for the rise of the military, but the military did not really come to fruition, like the true indigenous Byzantine military under the Comnenians did not really come to full strength until under his son, John John II. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But I will talk a little bit about the the things that Alexios did to um, reform the military a bit. So one thing that uh, Alexios did was that he realized that once the, the old elite Bodyguards, so like this, as I mentioned, the Scalae had been destroyed at Dyrrachion. The Varangians were vastly reduced. Um, he had to find a way to bring back these old, uh, strong elite troops that once you know guarded the empire. And so, one thing that he did was he found ways of getting manpower in ways that other emperors probably wouldn't have considered. So one thing that he did with the Varangians was that he recruited them from uh, from really far away locations. Uh, as Anna Comnena comments, um, she, they, they got the Varangians even all the way from Thule, which was uh, believed to be great, you know, what's today Britain. Um, so they got all these Anglo-Saxons that were serving. Um, and there's another interesting story that goes into the foundation of uh, Byzantine New England, which was a uh, uh, there was a group of um, refugees that had escaped to uh, escaped to the Byzantine Empire after the invasion of uh, the Normans in the north um, under uh, of course uh, William the Conqueror and they had made their way down to Byzantium and they were settled over in, uh, on the shore of the Black Sea and uh, I think uh, Alexius might have drawn his troops from there too uh, but there were you know sizable it was a very sizable contingent of the reformed ranging guard uh, that were made up of Anglo-Saxons and of, um, you know, kind of these northern Europeans rather than the old uh, Varangians, which had been true Varangians from, you know, the area what is now Ukraine. So in the, the areas of Kevin Rus um, and that area, although there still was probably a sizable contingent that uh, was made up uh, of men from true Scandinavia. So that was one of the things that he did was he accepted more different uh, different culture cultural groups into the v- ranks of the Varangian Guard. And he needed to because he needed to reestablish uh, the Pelikiferoi uh, or Pelikiferi, the um, the uh, axe bearing guard, so to speak. That's what that's what they were called. Uh, that's what they're referred to in almost every Byzantine source. Not only the Varangian Guard, but again the other elite troops uh, Two. So one of the units that Alexios formed himself was the Archontopoli, and those were the sons of various dead officers. So officers, officers that had been slain in battle. The sons uh, of their family were recruited into this new rank um, of essentially orphan bodyguard. So they were they were kind of an interesting merging of um, of uh, those orphans and military you know military troops so it, it was it's a very strange combination but turned out to be pretty effective they actually were housed in um, uh, the Imperial grounds uh, in one of the I think in one of the Imperial palaces um, and they were trained to be elite cavalry in war so Alexios used them in battle and it's said that he uh, he wept whenever they whenever they were slain in battle as if they were his own children. So that was another interesting unit that was formed under Alexios, and it's there is some evidence to support, although we don't have any like really concrete evidence that Alexios also reformed a couple of the old, um, old Scolai bodyguard as well, um, 
And we know that the uh, Athanati, that means those without death, the immortals, so to speak, were also reformed under Alexios. Um, and those, the Athanati made their uh, rise during the time of, um, uh, of John Simiskis. So this was way back during the Macedonian era, but Alexios still used troops uh, of the Athanati or armed in the manner of the Athanati. So yeah, there, there were a lot of things that he did, especially regarding the uh, elite bodyguard. Um, but the thing that Alexios knew was that he, his troops would, uh, during his lifetime, would not be able to, to match all of the foes that he faced. So this brings us to what he, his, his real, I guess, greatest accomplishment, so to speak, which is the reconquest of Byzantine lands during the time of the Crusades. So if you'd like me to go into that, um, I definitely Actually, will. Actually, yeah, I was just going to ask about, <clears throat> so you know, how far along, I was going to ask about how far along these reforms were uh, at the time of the Crusades, but I, I think it'd be best just to kind of jump right into, you know, what was the, the Byzantine role in starting the Crusades? Because it sounds like it really was um, Alexius looking around saying, I don't have enough, you know, soldiers to accomplish what I want and turning yep. to what had previously been a somewhat, uh, I guess you could say, uh, not the most amicable relationship with the, the Latin states, but turning to them for help. Yep. No, this is this is getting to the uh, prime of what the Alexia talks about, and this is the, of course, the the occurrence of the First Crusade. So, at this point in in uh, in Alexios's reign, he had started to enact. So this is we're talking about like around 1090, 1091, somewhere around there, just the turn of the the decade. Um, so Alexios had started a lot of his reforms. So he had he started his economic reform, uh, although his economic reform took a very long time, probably about 20 years to complete. Uh, a lot of his ina- new inactions had been put in place. So they were starting to, to ramp up. But again, as you said, uh, militarily, the empire was in, still in a very, very precarious situation. You know, again, most of the troops had been destroyed. It was around this time that the the claim that Alexios could only muster 500 troops to his banner occurred. So that's what this is around this period where where the empire had almost no troops. Um, and this is probably when he started to reform these new uh, bodyguard units um, that were so that would be, in my opinion. I mean, of course, people argue that the Comnenian period, um, these these elite bodyguard disappeared, but I think there's too much historical evidence to the contrary uh, to to um, you know to say that they disappeared because they they definitely didn't. There were definitely uh, mentions of them in various sources throughout the period. So, and even though we have scant sources, the fact that they exist tells us that they probably they were there. You know, so so anyways, um, getting into the Crusades. So Alexios. You're, as you as you mentioned before, he, he kind of was looking around. You know what? Where where can I get troops from? I I can't draw any indigenous troops. I got 500 men c- coming to my banner. That's it. That's all I can get. Uh, you know, all of the all of the lands surrounding me are enemies. How am I going to get my uh, my you know reconquer the territories that were lost under the that long era? Where you know no one knew what they were doing essentially, so he looked he looked around and he said, you know what, let's let's ask our brothers in the in the west. So he, as you know, Byzantium had a very long history of controversy with the Latin West, um, specifically during the Great Schism, 1054, where the the Eastern Western churches said we're permanently splitting. Uh, there's no more. Uh, no more collaboration with each other. We are different churches, and that's the end of that. And so, uh, and the thing is, throughout all of Byzantine history prior, it had been a struggle to keep the uh, the West in line, and it had just been over the years as the centuries went on, the the Pope had gotten more and more more concessions and 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 power in the West, and was able to finally break away by ten by 1054. Although he had been definitely been independent for a lot longer, um, at least uh, at least um, uh, before or at least until the uh, eight eight hundreds, uh, specifically with the crowning of Charlemagne. That was probably that's probably usually considered the time when the Pope was able to finally break with Byzantium because he did it in his uh, crowning of Charlemagne was in defiance of uh, the right of Empress Irene to rule. 
So, but anyways. So how oh, did you have- how did these how did these Western powers then react to uh, this this call from the the Byzantine em- emperor to come assist him in reconquering his lands? Okay, so here's the here, here's where we get into the origins and the interesting uh, aspects of the origins of the Crusade. So. Alexios had decided to send a delegation to the Council of Piacenza, which um, you know met in the early 1090s. And at the Council of Piacenza, uh, it was essentially like you can think of it as almost like a Council of Elrond, like all of these great powers <laughs> of of um, of Europe all met together, and they you know they very they argue over various things, um, you know mostly religious controversies, but they also argued over you know political scuffles and things like that. Um, who shows up but, you know, this delegation from the Byzantine emperor? And that didn't happen very often. Uh, it did not happen, especially considering that during, you know, the Great Schism, uh, basically the Eastern and Western churches were like, we're not, you know, we're not going to be <laughs> dealing with each other anymore. But, um, but yeah, so, so who shows up but this Byzantine delegation? And they say, they basically go before all of these leaders of these, uh, or not leaders, but delegations from these various countries, you know, um, and... They basically say, your brother in the east, Emperor Alexios, needs your help. He, he asks for your help. The, the, uh, you know, he, he basically makes it out to be that the, the vile Turks have taken our land and the emperor and the great city of Constantinople, you know, one of the great wonders of the Christian world, the, the in dire situation and are about to fall to the, to the Muslims. And, and they, they probably you know, took a lot of... Uh, you know, took took that very seriously when they heard that, and uh, according to most sources, uh, that delegation made it out to seem that it was a lot more dire than it really was. <laughs> they they were making it seem like it was actually like Constantinople was going to fall any day now, you know, kind of thing. But in reality, it probably wasn't that dire. Um, but regardless, they kind of leave the you know they leave the Council of Piacenza not, not really knowing what's going to happen. But they they kind of said, hey, we gave it our best pitch, you know. <laughs> they they gave it their best. So they came back to Emperor Alexios, and for a while they didn't hear anything. You know, a couple of years went by, and they didn't hear anything. But then all of a sudden, in uh, 1095, at the uh, Council of Clermont, Pope Urban II comes up and says. You know, all nations of Christendom, it's time to help our Christian brothers in the East. We will march, you know, forward with uh, the armies of Christ and, and, you know, defeat the Muslims, you know, so, and help our brother Alexios. So and the Pope Alex- was definitely won over. Oh, he, he, he was completely won over. And, and um, it, it's, it's just a fascinating turn of events that led up to, you know, from the Great Schism just, you know, 40 years before to, you know, Urban II, you know, you know, viciously uh, and and vehemently supporting uh, the Byzantine Empire in the east and and marching over. So, so you can kind of see that there there must have been some political motive towards it too. I mean, it couldn't have just been that he wanted to help Alexios because you don't just all of a sudden decide that oh these these uh, you know ostracized people in the east who we don't like. Well, we're just going to help them now. You know, it's it's just a, a fascinating turn of events. You could probably write a whole book on this. Um, in this subject and the reasons for why the the Crusades occurred, uh, but but ultimately it was Pope Urban II who essentially called for all these all these knights in in Western Christendom that had been you know they had been fighting each other and I think the Pope was kind of getting sick of the instability um, you know they were getting restless and so he was like well why don't we direct them towards something else you know <laughs> we'll we'll send them towards the east they can do something there essentially by in uh, you know ten ninety late 1095, early 1096, Alexios hears that this gigantic army of peasants is ransacking the, the lands of Hungary and is marching down through the western portions of the empire. And he's just like, what? All I asked for was a, you know, a couple thousand knights. I didn't ask for these peasants. And so this, you know, this giant horde of peasants just comes rampaging through their territory. And, uh, and they actually you know, did some damage along the way, according to Anna Komnena. But they arrived at the gates of Constantinople, and Alexios you know, is like, He's just looking out the door, and all he sees is, the, you know, all I can imagine is just, uh, you know, these peasants with pitchforks, you know, <laughs> armed with little more than their, than their, uh, you know, sackcloths. It's just, um, yeah, it's just a, a interesting dichotomy. But they en- ended up camping outside the gates of Constantinople, and Alexios finally said, "Well, you know what? We're gonna. I'll meet with the leader 
of this delegation. I can't do anything about it because, you know, we don't have the troops to fight off 40,000 of these guys, you know, even though they are poorly armed. So he met with the leaders, and it was, uh, of course, um, Peter the Hermit and Walter the Penniless. And people will probably take offense to Walter the Penniless, but I think it's just perfect for the, you know, for the time because his name was uh, Walter Sawyer. So you know, it's not translated properly when you say the Penniless. And, you know, whatever. <laughs> but these so are anyway. not these were not the high elite nobles that uh, Alexios had hoped for. Yes, exactly. I mean, he was he actually wasn't like he wasn't like completely downtrodden, but he wasn't he wasn't like the grand leader that Alexios probably felt should have arrived so what ends up happening at this point is alexios is like a negotiator he's really talking to peter and he's he's uh, he's telling him peter you shouldn't go across the straits you shouldn't be attacking the turks right now and but peter was like he was just like clamoring to attack and alexios according to anna Comnena, alexios advised him not to attack the turks because the basically knew he was going to get massacred because the, of course the, the Turks were dangerous to the Byzantines. They would be even more dangerous to a bunch of peasants, you know? Um, so anyways, uh, Alexios can't convince Peter the Hermit that, that, uh, it's, you know, not safe to cross, uh, because Peter the Hermit felt that like the hand of God would save him from, from the, these Turks. He felt that this crusade was like, to, you know, divinely appointed. It was, it was going to, anything they did was going to be the will of Christ. So, Alexios, fearing that there was going to be a massive rebellion, ferried the troops of um, Peter the Hermit and Walter the Penniless across the, the Bosphorus, and they landed, and uh, they marched inland. Didn't really get anything, get any resistance when they first went, so they, their spirits were high. Um, and then they kind of got a little bit further inland and got ambushed by the Turks, and they basically everything but 7,000 men survived. Uh, Alexios kind of knew what was going to happen, so there's some evidence to support that he had a, uh, a contingent crossover um, to kind of like back them up if they did fail. And so he left a couple, he left some ships on the opposite side uh, that were, you know, ready to receive the, you know, the, the remnants of the army. So kind of a, like, look, I can't have you sitting here at Constantinople all day, all night, but. We all know what's going to happen. Let's just go ahead and you go ahead and go over and I'll be here when you come back what's left of you. So uh, obviously this first kind of peasant crusade didn't <clears throat> work, uh, but, you know, there was an actual armed and trained group of people who did show up, you know, later to help. Yep. Yep, there was. And we'll get into that in a second. So so uh, Peter the Hermit survived the battle. Um, Walter the Penniless got killed. He, he had an arrow through his neck. Uh, apparently, so yeah, that that first wave of the crusade, the People's Crusade, so to speak, failed miserably, and really in part to uh, just the zealousness of the leaders of the crusade. I think Alexios, from what I can gather from the stories, it, it seems like Alexios didn't want them to cross. They wa he wanted them to wait so that the because he knew that another army was coming, and so he basically was just like, you know, why don't you just wait until the the actual troops, you know, the real you know soldiers arrive, and then you can help them. But uh, he was just worried that there was going to be a rebellion, and that there, you know, he wouldn't be able to put them down because there were just so many of them. So, anyways, um, in I think 1096, maybe six months after the disaster, I think it was um, it was so, it was like somewhere near Nikea, I think that they got destroyed, um, that that peasants' crusade got destroyed. But then uh, the real um, army of about 35,000 men under like the real crusader leaders like um, uh, Bohemond de Toronto, who we mentioned before. We'll talk about him in a second. Uh, you know, you have Raymond Sanjil and a um, bunch of other ones, you know, the, all the famous ones um, that, that everyone, you know, just you know, thinks is like the greatest thing, you know, since sliced bread. But, uh, but yeah, so those crusaders come down. Uh, they're well-armed, well-equipped, definitely a lot more impressive than, <laughs> than the, the People's Crusade, and they arrive at the gates of Constantinople. And Alexios, from what we can gather, is absolutely terrified because the these guys are so well equipped. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of them, these Latins, right? And Alexios, if they if they decided to train their eyes on Constantinople, they could have taken it if they wanted to. And there is actually a lot of uh, Anna Comnena comments on this and states that there was a lot of ambition to do it, 
But Alexios being, you know, his kind of uh, keen diplomatic, having his keen diplomatic ability, he basically made all of these uh, plans to make sure that they weren't going to uh, unite against him. So what he did was he separated all these all these crusader leaders uh, into their own contingents and forbid them from meeting with each other because he didn't want them collaborating to fight because he he felt that the the armies that were under each individual lord were were not powerful enough to individually beat his forces so he was able to separate them and then he also required them to swear fealty to him so Alexios required them to you know kneel kiss the kiss the ring so to speak right and um and ensure that they were not going to attack. He also met with personally with several of the leaders. Um, Bohemond of Toronto was one of them, and he basically said, "You know, I know, I know you were my enemy in the past, but uh, let's put aside our differences and let's accomplish something here." So uh, Anna Komnena paints it to be that Bohemond was kind of like treacherous and that he was still planning to do something. But uh, some of the other sources, I think, paint him in a little more positive light. But it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to, to believe the, uh, the other sources when you know what happened later with Bohemond and what he tried to do. So anyways, um, so all those crusader leaders, they meet with Alexios and they swear fealty. It took a little bit some, in some cases to actually get them to, to swear fealty, but eventually they all submitted. I think except for maybe one, but he eventually did uh, later on. <laughs> Peer pressure. And, yeah, and so uh, so basically, um, you have this thirty-five thousand man army. Swear fealty to Alexios has ambitions to attack Constantinople, but are kept from doing so by you know various means. There is a bit of a rebellion that occurs, and Alexios was actually really he was lucky in two cases. In one case, Anna Komnena mentions that all the uh, leaders of the Crusades met with him uh, in the great court in the court chamber. In Constantinople, and they were arguing with Alexios over uh, over various things. And apparently, a spear was hurled at his at his chair um, while he was sitting in it. And uh, apparently, it like landed right in the back of the chair uh, in the uh, of the throne. And uh, he just kind of sat there, and, you know, didn't do anything, and kind of like serenely, you know, told them, please, you know, please don't do that. You know, if, <laughs> well, if you kill me, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to be good for any of us. But I mean, he uh, was but yeah. kind of in an awkward situation where he needed these people, but he also really needed them not to be there anymore as well. Ex exactly. Yeah. So, so there's, uh, yeah. So I'd assume at yep. this point he's trying to, trying to hustle them out into Anatolia. Yes, he definitely is. But the thing is, he's trying to make sure that they have the knowledge they need to fight the Turks because he knows that after the first failure of the the, the People's Crusade, he needs to ensure that these you know these troops are prepared, that they are ready, and that they're actually going to do something instead of just being massacred like the previous wave of the Crusade. So the other thing that happened was there was a, a scuffle amongst some of the Crusaders, and they, they blamed Alexios for the whole thing, and they uh, they tried to attack Constantinople. Uh, and actually got into the city, but apparently Alexios's troops were well trained enough to uh, beat down and scare the uh, the Crusaders back out the city, <laughs> and they, they kind of went back to their camps afterwards. So um, yeah, it wasn't all of them, but it was a group of them that definitely did. So again, after uh, after that period where they were kind of preparing to cross, uh, Alexios kind of taught the uh, Crusaders or kind of tried to advise them on to how to fight the Turks because of course they really hadn't fought uh, you know Eastern in the Eastern warfare before um, and there were various things that were probably that probably had to be told to them uh, about the crossing of Anatolia which was extremely dry you know needed you need a lot of water um, probably Alexis probably told them about the various routes that they could take and so he probably he just advised them and then finally sent them on their way uh, with a contingent of Byzantine troops as well. Uh, General Titikios, who is one of uh, Alexios's leading generals, uh, actually accompanied the Crusaders um, on the journey, although it was uh, they were disappointed because they, they were hoping that Alexios would be leading the Byzantine army and leading all of Christendom to fight the, you know, the great Muslim hordes, so to speak. But Alexios, fearful of the fact that these, you know, there were these Crusaders floating around as well as uh, political enemies that may have still been kind of swept under the rug in his initial in the initial part of his reign might 
come back to bite him. So he wanted to stay in Constantinople yeah, to didn't ensure want to be that the end- stuck in the middle of an army of potentially hostile people. Yep, and that too. There's a many reasons for why he didn't want to go, but chief probably chief among them was that he did not want to lose control of Constantinople because if that fell or that you know fell to anyone else, uh, that would have been disastrous and that would have ended the empire. So he knew that it was the empire was in a good position because these crusaders were finally out and they were on their way, but they also it also was still very vulnerable and that it needed to be held, and so there was a lot of consideration there. So as as you know, the rest is really history. The Crusaders march to uh, march through Anatolia. Uh, some very famous battles at uh, Dori Lam. That was probably one of their first uh, major victories, other than Nikea, where uh, actually Alexios negotiated with the Turks to uh, hand over the city, and the Crusaders weren't too happy about it. <laughs> they uh, they uh, they wanted to loot the city, but the Byzantine art of war kind of like didn't really support the idea of like looting. They didn't, they didn't believe in that because they were, you know, quote unquote, good Christians and they didn't want that. And they were also the, taking uh, back their own cities at this point. And that's true too. Exactly. They, they're taking back their own cities and they don't want to lose, you know, what was left of, of those old cities. So, so yeah, they kind of like tried to bar the crusaders from uh, looting things, but eventually the crusaders got far enough that they felt that, Hey, you know what? We've, we've given the, emperor enough stuff we're just going to keep going on so they dismissed Tatikios sometime before i think the siege of antioch and uh eventually they 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 basically did what they did and got their reputation for what they did during that that period you know the, Such uh, as the, the massacre of jerusalem yeah massacre at jerusalem yeah which is almost universally hailed as one of the most terrible events you know in terms of butchery but so, uh but from a byzantine side this managed to capture a great deal of land for the byzantine empire yes they did um the most of uh most of the old territory was captured um but the thing is to re- to remember is that even though the lands had been captured the damage that the turks had done um during their time there uh had been almost irreparable most of the cities were in ruins by the times that the time that the uh, byzantines got back to them the uh, a lot of the old uh, farmland was basically gone well, this, this the area had basically were, been a, a war zone for almost a century at this point yes and that's that's part of it and the other part is too the turks were more pastoral so they didn't really um you know they didn't really cultivate the things that were cultivated under the Byzantines. So uh, a lot of the farmland had just turned to pasture. And so that, you know, it didn't really, it didn't really uh, lend itself to supporting the cities that had once existed there. So you can think of it as almost like, you know, the area was depopulated. Um, It was definitely less um, cultivated than it had once been. Um, And again, the manpower had been essentially deported or killed uh, under the Turks, um, had either been moved to far the Far East, or the the people no longer existed. So, or they had fled as refugees because that had happened too. So but, they'd, um, they'd regain the heart of the empire, but the the heart was significantly weakened. Yes, it was. Uh, it was essentially rotten at this point. And even even during the time of uh, even like at the end of the Comnenian era, it still hadn't been completely um, restored. As a, it, it still had significant um, gaps. Uh, in its defenses, significant gaps in its uh, economic um, development, and it never again had re- um, returned to its uh, previous uh, glory. So, but at this point, we're we're reaching the kind of the 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 end of Alexios's reign and his life. So, uh, before we move on to uh, his son John, uh, what we you know were there significant post Crusade uh, accomplishments that you want to cover before we head into that? Sure. Um, so let's just finish up with the, the, the First Crusade. So, um, you know, really with the with the siege of um, Edessa and Antioch, um, that was the formation, the start of the Crusader states. So with the capture of, I think Edessa was the first. The capture of Edessa, I think 1097 was the, or 1098. It was, one, it was I don't remember exactly when, but it was in, in those two years. Um, that capture uh, saw the foundation of the first of the Crusader states, the um, and uh, then you had um, Antioch was captured. Uh, that formed another crusader state. And then, of course, you had the um, Kingdom of Jerusalem, which was formed when 
uh, Jerusalem was captured. And that formed, of course, the Crusader states, which would last for about another hundred years after their, their capture. So, so that was really the end of the First Crusade. The result is that the, it's shown that the uh, Turks were significantly weak at that point, mostly because of the disunity of, of Islam at that point. Uh, there was an era, right, like during the era that, uh, that where the Byzantines were in decline, the Turks were actually in, uh, you know, huge um, on, on the upsurge. They were doing extremely well under uh, Malik Shah. They actually controlled basically all the way from the edge of the Sea of Marmara, all the way into Persia and down through the, um, you know, down into Syria. They controlled a huge swath of land. But after Malik Shah died, there was a, a huge scuffle uh, amongst the uh, successors, and it basically fragmented uh, Islam severely during that period. So really during the Comnedian period, after the Crusades, the uh, Islamic states are extremely weak. Um, and it's not really until Saladin's rise that the uh, Islamic states become uh, a unified and all, essentially all-powerful force um, was able to challenge the Christian kingdoms that arose during this period. So, so any, anyways, the uh, end of the First Crusade, um, again with the capture of Jer Jerusalem um, in, I think, 1099. And then uh, there was another crusade that occurred in 1101, but it was really just to reinforce the... Uh, Crusader states. So once that was done, um, the, the you know, Addendum the, Crusade. Yeah, it was essentially just to reinforce what the uh, Crusaders had captured. Because of course, you know, thirty-five thousand men. They probably lost. They lost quite a few along the way. Um, and they also, you know, thirty-five thousand men to hold that all that area is probably, you know, definitely not enough. So they got all these uh, pilgrims and various other and more support from the from the West to uh, help them in the Crusade of eleven oh one. So. Finally, by really the you know by the turn of the of the century, by the turn of the 12th century, the uh, Crusader states had been founded. Um, Byzantium had essentially been restored to some to similar borders to what it had been uh, in previous years, but it still had been uh, it still was extremely weak um, at its core, and it needed to be uh, refounded. Although Alexios's reforms had gone a long way into stabilizing what was left, so. So yeah, there, um, so Byzantium and the Crusader states kind of were in a inevitable link to each other. There's a, and this is something that's not really not really seen a lot, I think, in, in a lot of analyses of the era. But if you look at the at the Crusader states and their well-being, it only really was uh, could survive if Byzantium survived. And that's because the support that they got from the Byzantines was, and also the, the fact that the Byzantines were essentially the Crusader states' uh, you know, protector, in essence, especially later on, uh, was what kept them alive. Yeah, they uh, without they them, as strong we enough saw, to stand on their own. Exactly. They were not strong enough to stand on their own. That's seen uh, and essentially proven by the fact that um, as soon as Byzantium started to falter in by in the 1180s, we know that the capture of Jerusalem occurred in 1187, only about two years after the fall of the, the Komnenos dynasty. So, you know, you can tell that there was obviously some really important link between Byzantium and the Crusader states just by looking at that. Um, and there's also many other arguments you can make uh, regarding that. But that's that's something I, I'd really like the uh, you know listeners to know is that you know the Crusader states were very much tied to the well-being of Byzantium, and likewise. Um, Byzantium was also tied to the well-being of the Crusader states, so that's something to keep in mind. So, uh, as we near the end of Alexios's life, uh, how did he establish his succession? Um, what you know, how did he spend his his waning years? I guess. Okay, so after, really after um, the Crusade had passed through, Alexios had really started focusing more on, uh, you know, the economic reforms, the government reforms. He he tried to um, you know completely change up. You know how things had been done in the past. As I talked about before, he was more supportive of his family in the government rather than you know these various random uh, people from other great families. And I mean, there, I guess there was some resentment of that, but in the end, it was quite successful in you know establishing a solid, powerful dynasty. So it was really dynasty building after after the crusade had passed through. Um, now. Really, what had happened uh, in his last years, uh, Alexios kind of like retired. You know, he he did some stuff, but he was you know he had fought for so long 
uh, against impossible odds that, you know, you can only really see this as, you know, Alexios' retirement in his last years because he just did so much um, to restore the Empire in his early reign uh, that he kind of deserved it, really. And this is similar, actually, to a lot of other uh, emperors in the past, you know, Roman emperors. For example, Diocletian, after he had completely reformed the Roman Empire, had uh, had done the same thing. He retired to his villa and, you know, just lived out his life. Famously raised but, uh, cabbages, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, Alexios um, in his last years, he didn't really he didn't uh, he did you know managed his his uh, his plans, but generally he gets he seems to uh, have kind of receded a little bit from the limelight. He also um, uh, probably because of his uh, rest um, and maybe his old age at this point, uh, he started to get a, a severe case of gout, which um, Anna Comnena and um, his mother uh, and her mother uh, Irena Dukena took care of him. While he was, uh, you know, he could, he had difficulty moving, um, and I think that was one of the reasons for his uh, his decline in health was uh, when he started to get his gout. Um, probably again from from lack of activity. That's generally what causes that. So, so yeah, he, he started to get gout um, probably in the maybe around 11, 10, 11, 10 or so, um, and for the next eight years or so, he kind of lived in he lived his life in pain. He couldn't really walk very well. Um, and his succession was always really, it was not always solidified because he, while he had proclaimed John as his, as his heir, there was always the issue that Anna, because she was the, the oldest daughter and that before she, her brother John was born, she had been told that she was raised to be empress. She was, she was going to be empress. So you'll see throughout the Alexiad. Anna does not talk about her brother hardly at all in in the book. She barely mentions him. Like she mentions him by name, I think only twice in the entire book, and that's because she always hated the fact that he was declared as emperor over her. Even the, she thought she was prepared to be empress, and she, really she was. She was the most well-read um, and probably the brightest scholar of her day. Uh, she was married to a great military leader. Remember, I talked about uh, she was married to Nikephoros Briennios, right? Who was the either the son or the grandson of the one that Alexios had fought um, in his early years of his reign. And overall, she just felt that she was better equipped to be to be the leader of the empire over her brother. And I think Alexios also loved Anna very much. And I think that she and I think she loved him. And I think that she felt that um, maybe her brother didn't didn't really understand what her father tried to do. So Anna wanted to continue what her father had started. And so she felt that she had a better right than her brother to be empress. Um, so you know, how, so that, how did we end up with a, with a John the second as opposed to a Anna the first? Anna, Anna the, the Anna first, something. yes. Yeah. Um, so when Alexios was on his deathbed in 1118, he... Um, it was again. The, this there were tensions were pretty high because, uh, again, Anna. People knew that Anna wanted to be empress, and she even had the support of her mother and a lot of people in the government. Of course, her her husband also supported her, and if, with her husband as a military leader, uh, she would have been a very formidable force to uh, to challenge um, John's reign. Now, John was John, of course, has shown out to be a very capable leader himself. Um, but I think his position was definitely in question when Alexios was dying. And so in his final hours, Alexios probably, they, they often say that Alexios was probably extremely troubled by, by thoughts of what would happen when he died because he didn't want to see his dynasty fall apart simply because of family feud, essentially. What ended up happening was that uh, when Alexios died, John rushed to his side and he took a signet ring and according to Anna, he took the signet ring. But the thing is, it's, uh, it's unclear as to whether he was there before, but Anna makes it out to be that he rushed to his father's, uh, his father's side and it's taken the ring from him as if he, he was trying to say that Alexios had declared him as emperor. And I think he actually publicly proclaimed that later, but Anna doesn't agree with that. She thinks that it, it wasn't true. What the real story was is impossible to say because there's conflicting stories. And But there's a, a reason that Anna might have fabricated the story uh, because she wanted her claim as empress. Um, certainly, although Alexios was supportive of women in government, it might be a little bit hard to make the 
uh, case that he had declared her as empress in his final hours. But regardless of what act what actually happened, um, Anna lost the support of her husband, which in turn basically uh, caused the whole yeah, thing to fall undercut apart. the the you know if you have this patriarchal system, it's it's hard to say well, uh, it, once your husband turns against you, that kind of undercuts the uh, the the balance there. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is that. Uh, Anna, once her, she lost the support of her husband, and the reason is said that she lost the support of her husband was not because you know he felt that she wasn't capable, but because he Briennios was afraid because he Alexios was so uh, he was kind of like a, a, an idol to him. You know he was he he was very much admired by Briennios, and um, I think the thing is that he was afraid that if he had supported Anna, it would have been disastrous for the empire. That things would not have gone as well, so he re he rescinded his support for his his wife, and uh, that ended that, so to speak. So we have the ascension of John the Second then, and what kind of uh, challenges was he facing at this time? Because it seems like the um, the empire is on some pretty good footing at this point. You know, the mm -hmm. the Crusaders have helped take back major portions of of uh, the heartland, which although not of course you know as as productive as they were, but it seems like the the situation is very kind of stabilized. Yeah, so the Empire itself was uh, in a pretty good position at this point, although it still had its internal weaknesses. It uh, definitely was a lot more uh, stable than it had been in pretty much recent memory. You know, um, The economy was starting to, to, to um, uh, ramp up again. Uh, that was especially made true because the Italian states... Um, especially Venice, had started to really uh, trade with the Empire a lot. And that was because in the early years of Alexios's reign, um, he had given concessions to Venice in support uh, because the Venetians had provided ships to the Emperor to fight the Normans. So uh, Alexios gave con uh, tr special trading concessions to the Venetians, which allowed them to really benefit from trade to the, the East. So... Um, so that was one thing that had stabilized the economy. So the economy was very stable. The military, again, the elites that I had talked about, the elite forces that Alexios had started to to uh, you know rekindle, um, those were starting to come back, um, and definitely the the indigenous forces were starting to come back as well. And then, of course, the gains that were made under the Crusaders uh, and the small contingent of the Byzantines um, started to to be rebuilt and and uh, re. Um, Regarrisoned. So, so yeah, the Byzantines were doing well. The Turks were essentially smashed. They had very little that they could do um, but watch at this point. And really, the borders of the empire were very secure. So, at the accession of John, so Alexios died in 1118. Anna's plot failed, uh, and she was um, she was imprisoned for a time. And uh, John of course, took the throne and was able to establish himself, in part because of his best friend. And, and the relationship between John and his best friend, uh, John Aksuk, is probably one of the strongest relationships uh, in the history of the empire. Um, so John Aksuk was a, a, a Byzantine Turk, very interesting, uh, who was a childhood friend of John. And uh, they, they really were like a dynamic duo. Uh, they were both great military leaders, and uh, they did a lot to... Um, support the empire in, in the years following Alexios. Um, John Aksuk was also, I think, extremely vital in that in that night when Alexios had passed away, because I think he was the one who, who told John that uh, of the death of his father. So, so anyways, um, so the rise of John, uh, one of the first things he did was he told his sister that her behavior was unacceptable and that he was going to confine her to a monastery or basically house. It was house arrest at first, um, and later on she she uh, she moved to a monastery. But uh, basically, yeah, she she got a very lavish house that she lived at in Constantinople. Um, but she couldn't leave. She could never leave the house. Um, she could only have visitors. So so that was the thing. That was the way that John had kept his sister from being dangerous any longer. So yeah. So John's. Probably one of John's first actions was to um, he he kind of did undid a few of the things that Alexios did during his reign. He really focused on reviving the military more so than his father did, basically creating uh, new training programs for the for the uh, military, and also he really supported uh, buildings. Um, he 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 was really into uh, creating new. Ch he built a lot of new churches. Um, he even built a few hospitals. Um, 
one of one of which is uh, was a very large hospital and had actually is one of the first examples of a hospital with separate wards for patients um, and also separate wards for women too and even had women doctors so that was uh, in there was those were known as Zenonia uh, the hospitals um, but the the building of the state under John uh, John's early reign is uh, arguably what allowed the Comnenian uh, dynasty to really endure for as long as it did because um, while Alexios was more concerned with the economy he wasn't as concerned really with the construction efforts that were really done um, under John. Uh, John's construction efforts were absolutely uh, extensive and so a lot of the things that had been uh, neglected in the century, uh, really in the century past, uh, were really rebuilt under John. I almost remember um, something about, I think that the, uh, even the aqueduct um, of Valens was rebuilt under John II. So you can tell that there was a huge revival in the infrastructure of the empire during that period, not, you know, and not in addition to the military. Yeah, the reign of John is really uh, marked by uh, an expansion of the military, expansion of the of the infrastructure, and this is what allowed them to uh, allow the Byzantines to really kind of solidify their claims on the lands that had been captured by the quote unquote captured by the Crusaders and then been turned over to the emperor, and also to even expand even further. So under John's reign, a lot of new territory was gained especially because of his obsession with Syria. He, John seemed to have a, a, a want to retake Antioch. And there was actually, a um, uh, even prior to him, Alexios had dealt with Bohemond again. If you remember Bohemond uh, the, uh, from S the Sicilian Normans, he was a leader of the Crusades, as I had mentioned before. And he had actually established himself as the lord of Antioch and uh, had caused a lot of trouble because he... he he basically treacherously turned on Byzantines and had uh, established himself as a uh, uh, as hostile to the empire, and so he had fought Alexios and he was finally uh, subdued. And really, John was obsessed with taking Antioch once and for all for the empire because Antioch was the ancient capital of the East of the empire, and so it was very important for him to establish control in that area. And the other thing too was that uh, John also marched at the head of an army down to the Crusader states to really kind of, you know, bully them a little bit, to tell them, you know, you're not, you know, what Bohemond did, you better not do either because our army is powerful now. And we're going to march down and make sure that you keep the peace. So, so there's a, a kind of um, kind of funny thing that goes on there too, where uh, John is he marches down with his army and just basically establishes exerts, who's in charge. Yeah, he establishes who is in charge. And by this point, this you know this is getting to the 1130s, 1140s. Uh, it's really um, you know it really solidifies the power of the empire. Now, the other thing that John did during his reign was that. John married uh, Princess Piroshka of Hungary, and that was a huge benefit to the empire because it created a another ally, an ally that, you know, Byzantium didn't really have many allies in its history, and so creating that ally with, uh, with Hungary was, was great, especially by marriage. So, um, so that was huge, and that actually played in very well in, in Manuel Komnenos' reign. And that was important for, for him as well. So that really established the dominance of the Komnenian uh, dynasty, uh, that marriage to Princess Piroshka, who later became Irene. She was renamed to Irene. So, so yeah. But, yeah, a, a proper yeah. Greek name. No, so I, I think what I want to do is kind of, uh, so we have the, we have John kind of establishing and reestablishing and solidifying uh, the, the boundaries of the empire and kind of building the interior. But I, I think what we've really been focusing on is kind of the, the more militaristic history of the, mm -hmm. the Byzantines. So, and I know that uh, Manuel, uh, it, the, the, the son of John is um, kind of, kind of like a, a second coming of Alexios in certain ways. So why don't we go ahead and move on to talking about Manuel? Okay. So, so the, the thing that I want to, um, you know, let you know is that John's reign, I mean, I didn't really comment much about, uh, in detail about the military. And the reason for that, uh, really, you know, throughout John's reign, uh, we don't have a really good idea about him. Because unfortunately, in a lot of, in the sources that we have about that period, John Kofenos seems to be uh, kind of always on the periphery of the, of the, um, 
of the histories. In uh, John Kinemos's um, history, he's he only gets a couple pages. He starts at the beginning, kind of talking about what John did in his reign, but he doesn't go very in depth with what he does. And uh, likewise for most of the other chroniclers that focus on the Comnenian era. Um, in, in Nikitas Kaniates' work, same thing. He he only focuses a little bit on John, does and focuses much more on Manuel. So John's reign is really kind of uh, it's it's vague. It's it's very dim. Like we don't have a very good picture of it, and that's why I can't give you so as many details uh, well, as I can about Manuel yeah, or Alexios. He, he inherited that strong state from uh, from his father, and it seemed like his main job was to not mess that up. Exactly, and I think the other thing too is that John, in many cases, uh, John was a. He seems to almost have been a rather private person. Um, he it said that he was extremely pious, and he had the, the uh, nickname John the Good uh, for his piousness. But apparently, he wasn't very good looking either, so he's not really remarkable. Like people probably didn't see him as a very remarkable person, even though he was a very effective administrator and a very effective military leader. And I think the other thing too is that there's a little bit of almost um it almost seems that it's purposely obscured because the interesting thing is the story about how john died and that is um john went on a campaign he went a campaign to uh, kilikia which is of course down in like the southern part of what's today turkey and he was uh he had campaigned against a number of different enemies there and so he had actually subdued you know the the various peoples that he was trying to fight i think he was trying to fight the uh there was a, a like a runaway state i think of the Armenians, uh, or something like that. I, I don't remember exactly who who uh, who ruled it, but it was like a breakaway state of the Armenians, and they they he was um, he fought them in Kilikia, and uh, he beat he defeated them. And uh, after the campaign, uh, after he had he actually marched all the way down, I think to Antioch during that campaign, and this is of this is in 1142, I think, and. He, he returned to Kalikia because it was a much more defensible position, and he was preparing for a new campaign the next year to finally root out the last of the Turks in the east. And so he was kind of relaxing during the winter months while his army was stationed there in, in Kalikia, and he went on a hunting uh, trip. And as the story goes, during the hunting trip, John was, uh, he, he was poisoned by a, uh, he accidentally pricked his finger on a poisoned barb, and uh, it killed him. It, they couldn't. They couldn't uh, save him from the poison, and so it's it's often said that that was perhaps an assassination attempt or assassination that occurred there. But there's no concrete evidence of it because again, we have very scant sources on exactly what happened. It, but yes, regardless, the, the died in a, died in a hunting accident. Yeah, but it, it's very strange because uh, again, John was not that old when he died just shy of 50 i believe and it's just very very suspicious the way he died because he he was such a vigorous uh and lively figure and just having him die during a hunting accident uh pricking his finger you know on a on a barb is very very strange so anyways john dies in 1143 and uh, the succession that occurs is very strange during this era as well so manuel was not the oldest child. He was in fact one of the youngest, if not the youngest, uh, child of John. And um, the reason that he succeeded, I believe, was because John had decided that Manuel's older brothers were not really suited uh, for leading. Manuel was apparently very good looking. He was uh, a strong military leader. John, I think, felt that he was the most capable of, of his sons. And so, and the other thing too was that he was also, I believe, the son of. Um, uh, he was a son that was very much interested and tied to the the West. And you'll you'll see that in his policies, he's very pro-Western, even more so than the the other Komneni. The the Komneni as a whole are very pro-Western compared to most Byzantine emperors, and that's arguably one of the reasons uh, why they were so great. Um, but Manuel was that to the extreme. He was he was a, a you know a Western Western file, if you can say that, or Occident file, or whatever, <laughs> however you say it. But but any in any case, Manuel succeeds uh, accedes to the throne in 1143, and he really becomes uh, he's 
he's really very well loved. He had to secure his throne, of course. Um, I think he did that through uh, John X. Suk. And John X. Suk's son, Alexios X. Suk, was a great friend of Manuel as well. So Manuel had that strong uh, tie to the military because um, John and Alexios X. Suk were both uh, very well noted generals. Um, arguably some of the best uh, during the Pecumenian period. So he had the support of the army. Um, again, he was a very good military leader himself. And Manuel was extremely ambitious. Um, that was one thing that, that uh, was very noted um, during his life. So as Manuel was extremely young, he was similar to Alexios in that he had to marry uh, someone, right? He had to find someone to marry. So uh, he actually organized a uh, arranged a marriage with uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Conrad III, at, the, at that time. Um, and of, the thing is, Manuel loved women, and he loved very pretty women. So uh, he was hoping that uh, this the princess of the Holy Roman Empire, whose name was Bertha, uh, was going to be extremely beautiful. Unfortunately, she turned out to be a very plain, uh, actually somewhat ugly woman. He could have taken a more beautiful wife, but if he had done that, he would have destroyed his ambitions that would have been like hugely developed if he had married the prin the princess the alliance the was simply too important yeah the the alliance was too important for him to give up so he eventually married bertha um she turned out to be a very uh, apparently a very um uh, loyal wife but uh, he just wasn't really a fan of her <laughs> he just he just didn't give her the time of day but it did allow him the ability to call in conrad to help him in his wars in italy and so one of the greatest ambitions of manuel was to reestablish the catepanate of italia and he really was you know in his early years of his reign he was very focused on retaking it so um i think it was in uh the early 1050s manuel organized an invasion of Bari, which of course was the kind of the stronghold of southern Italy. And he actually succeeded in landing troops there and was able to even uh, lay siege to Bari and even took a couple of the cities in the area. Um, but unfortunately, uh, his, his, the help that he was supposed to get uh, never came. And he wasn't able to completely subdue the, the Normans, uh, who at this time I believe were under Roger... Roger II, uh, who, if you know anything about Norman Sicily, Roger II is arguably the greatest of their leaders. Um, so they were undergoing a you know great uh, period of, of uh, uh, essentially a golden age, really. It was, it was really their golden age he at that point. He attacked them at their strongest point. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, eventually the, uh, the help that Manuel had wanted uh, didn't come to fruition and so he did, he was a, he failed in his attack on southern Italy but he always had his eye on it you know he was always waiting for for a chance to strike um, and then uh, Manuel also had ambitions in uh, the, the uh, Levant and the Crusade like south of the Crusader states and also in Fatimid Egypt um, because at this point again I had said that the the Muslim factions had been extremely fragmented and uh, were still kind of scuffling amongst each other and Manuel saw it as a prime opportunity to to attack and so uh, Bertha died unfortunately kind of right around the time when his attack on uh, Barry had failed and so uh, and I think what had happened was his alliance with the uh, Holy Roman Empire had fallen apart I think because of Frederick Barbarossa because Conrad died and Frederick Barbarossa came to power, and Frederick Barbarossa didn't like Manuel very much. Um, so the the whole alliance with the Holy Roman Empire fell apart, and so uh, so Manuel turned his eyes to the east, and so he organized this invasion of of Fatimid Egypt, um, along with the Crusader states. And in the meantime, he had organized a marriage to the very beautiful Maria um, of uh, Antioch, and so she um, she was a much more pleasing wife to him. Uh, and bore him a couple of, uh, I believe, one son, Alexios II. Um, but she, she was also, you know, of course, a Latin, and some people didn't like that. They felt that it was, it wasn't good that they, that these Latins who who Manuel admired were all of a sudden, you know, making you know huge headway in the empire and becoming a huge amount of, inf you know, huge influence on them. But uh, regardless, um, uh, I think it was Amalric, the leader of the of the. Uh, Crusader states and Manuel organized an, uh, a two-pronged invasion of of uh, Egypt, and they were attacked. They attacked at Damietta, and uh, Manuel had a massive navy 
uh, by this time. By this time, the uh, forces of Byzantium were uh, again at their superpower status. They were, uh, you know, they were arguably the most powerful uh, force in the Mediterranean again under Manuel. Um, that was in part because of of uh, Manuel's father, who had completely reorganized the military and had uh, done much to uh, improve the economy. So uh, Byzantium was in a prime position to make many, many gains. So uh, this two-pronged invasion of Damietta on the coast of uh, Egypt, it looked as if it was going to succeed. The Crusaders had gone through Gaza and through the Sinai Peninsula and had marched to, you know, through that that area and had come to the area of, uh, you know, basically the Nile Delta. And the Byzantines had amassed, a, I think, a 250-ship navy that uh, also included probably uh, 20,000 men or so uh, invasion force that um, then sieged Damietta. And I think they actually succeeded in taking it. But unfortunately, the Crusaders and the Byzantines didn't get along. They had a lot of trouble, and so they, they kind of like, quabbled among themselves and they couldn't reconcile their differences and so the whole invasion fell apart and uh, they lost Damietta and uh, the invasion failed. So Manuel is kind of distraught by that because he felt that the, you know it was the prime time for the Fatimids to fall and that he would have been able to uh, retake it from them but unfortunately uh, it didn't work out that way and uh, the invasion failed. So two of his invasions failed even though the, from uh, you know on paper they should have succeeded overwhelmingly. Good starts so, on both but poor follow through I guess you could say. Yes um, I think it was just the fact that Manuel had overestimated his um, his ability to to win the the crusaders over because again manuel was very pro-western he actually even uh he, he even um, supported uh western style jousts uh would dress in western armor um he he absolutely loved the west and that's what made him extremely popular with a lot of the western leaders and the troop and the western troops as well crusaders loved him um but the thing is again uh, I think he overestimated his the uh, relationship between the East and West. Yeah. His his own occidentophilia couldn't uh, overcome the the real couldn't very be. real you know the real politic of the these two kind of uh, situations yep. between the Crusader states and the Latin states and the Byzantines all vying for power in the region. Yep, and he couldn't bridge the gap. He couldn't completely bridge the gap between the two. And the thing is, too, he also and I forgot to mention this. He also during this time had tried to secure the un, uh, uniting of the two churches again. He actually came extremely close. The Pope actually um, actually was, uh, actually was had sent him uh, a message saying, uh, we're ready to unite if you want to, re if you want to unite. But unfortunately, his, uh, the Pope's advisors and, uh, and bishops were like, oh, I don't know about this. You know, this, this might not be a good idea. So it ended up falling apart. So again, Manuel had, he came, he came within, like, is so tantalizingly close to doing amazing things. But again, it just, it, it just fell right through his fingers, right as he was about to grasp that success. So, I guess the final thing in Manuel's reign, the, the, the real heart wrencher, is after failing to take Bari, after failing to take Damietta, and after failing to reunite the churches, Manuel finally turned on his one, the one last enemy he really didn't, hadn't focused on, which was finally getting rid of the Turks. And the Turks, of course, had been beaten back um, in recent years. They, they really couldn't, they didn't really pose much of a threat at this point, but they did have a new leader, Kilij Aslan, um, who was, uh, I think, the great grandfather of, or the great uh, grandson of um, of uh, Alperslan, and so, uh, so that that was like their, his last um, thing. So he amassed a gigantic army, the largest that had been seen since the days of Romanos Diogenes. Uh, it consisted probably of about forty thousand men, which was huge for the time. Um, forty thousand man armies were not seen very often. Uh, during that time period. And this was taken from not only indigenous Byzantine forces, which probably numbered about 25,000, but also included uh, another con the remaining contingent of, uh, of mercenaries, probably from the West, and that, who, of course, would have naturally supported Manuel because of his popularity. So he marched to basically destroy the Sultanate of Konya, which was in Iconium, which was kind of in the center of, of Anatolia. And that was like the last stronghold of the Turks. If, if he had taken that, then he would, have, he would have probably destroyed the Turks once and for all and pushed them all the way back 
past the uh, Armenian border. But unfortunately, Manuel fell into the same kind of the same trap that Romanos Diogenes did, in that he he, he kind of marched through a narrow pass and was ambushed by the Turks, even though his army was vastly was probably vastly larger than the Turkish army. His army got demo, uh, demoralized because the Turks surrounded them and were like kind of like picking them off while they passed through this narrow uh, pass near Mirio Kefalon. And so Manuel's army kind of retreated, uh, and it was for him a disaster. But honestly, he didn't really lose that many men. It was just it shamed him so much to know that he couldn't even beat the Turks, even though he had a vastly superior army. And he, he, he felt that he was the best leader. You know, He was the real leader of Christendom and that he failed in all of his endeavors. And so that was in 1176, near the end of his reign. And that's actually interesting enough where um, John Kinemos ends his narrative. So John Kinemos is really the one of the principal um, uh, chroniclers of Manuel's reign. And uh, he, he was probably a soldier along with Manuel in the army. And so that it tells us that, that he ends his, his, his narrative in 1176, that it was such a severe blow to not only the empire's prestige, but also the emperor's personal prestige, that it wasn't even worth continuing the story. So... <laughs> In the end, uh, Manuel, he lived for another four years, but it's often argued that he probably just lost the will to live, even though 10 years earlier he had been extremely vigorous, very, very excited to, uh, to, um, you know, f to make some gains for Byzantium. But once after Miracephalon, he was completely demoralized and basically faded into obscurity and finally died in 1180, really a, a sad, broken man. So and that was we, the end. We, yeah, so we have the, the, you know, the, the reign of Manuel, which is really essentially just a giant ball of historical what ifs um, mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, good starts, good ambition, but, you know, poor execution and just bad luck and occasion with him. Uh, but this brings us to the, the reign of, well, I, I don't want to say the reign of, but the, the accession of his son to the throne, which is kind of the, the start of the, the downfall of this dynasty. So uh, tell us yes. a little bit about, about what happened uh, after Manuel died. Okay, so, so Manuel died, as I said, in 1180, um, leaving his 10-year-old uh, son, Alexius II, nominally as the, the heir to the throne, but he wasn't of age yet. So he had his mother, Maria Zena, who was, uh, of course, Maria of Antioch, um, be his uh, regent, right? And so uh, what had happened was uh, we have to kind of go back a little bit because we have to give a little bit of background to what led to the decline of Alexius II's reign. And so what actually had happened was, uh, as we talked about before, the Venetians had gotten a huge amount of concessions from Alexius. Um, very early in the in the Comnenian era, and the Venetians gained hugely from the trade to the east, and naturally that persisted, you know, even until the last days of the Serene Republic, right? So the thing was that um, by this point, by the time of Manuel, the Venetians uh, had gained so much power that they even got their own quarter in Constantinople. The, uh, the Venetians, the Genoese, the Pisans, all of those Italian states had their own quarter in Constantinople. And it's said that they probably numbered almost 15,000 in, in that Latin quarter, they called it the Latin quarter in Constantinople. And that's really a testament to how Western, pro-Western the Comnenians were. They were very much uh, bent on this idea that, you know, the, the Latins, I guess, aren't too bad. They can help us. You know, we're all Christians here. We can work together. And, I mean, of course, there were difficulties with getting them to, to uh, you know, do what the empire wanted. But by and large, during most of the Comnenian period, the, the uh, Latin traders were of benefit. Unfortunately, during the time of Manuel, they had become so powerful that they, could, they really felt that they had the autonomy to do whatever they wished. They kind of, they, there was a bunch of issues with uh, looting, um, and there were various attacks 
from various quarters on each other. So like the, the Ven Venetians would attack the Pisans, the Pisans would attack the Genoese, the Genoese would attack the Venetians, and it just became a huge mess. So um, they're their they, own faction, a political faction within the empire, but they're also their own political faction against each other as well. Ex exactly. So so they, they often vied for their, their power in, in, the, in the capital city itself. And of course, as you know, you know Constantinople um, throughout much of its history was designed to be the perfect metropolis. You had guards on every corner. It was supposed to be, you know, you, you weren't supposed to be out after dark. Uh, the emperors kind of uh, enforced this uh, very strict um, civil code that was designed to keep um, the people in the city uh, as peaceful and as, uh, you know, non-revolting as possible, right? So, but it, of course, it was the wonder of, of uh, you know, the world. You know, as, as it said later on, the city of the world's desire, right? But anyways, uh, it was this civic code and, and metropolitan lifestyle uh, that Constantinople had um, that the emperors prided themselves on. And so, you know, as the you know most culturally developed um, location in the world, naturally they they liked the peace. And so, these disturbances in the in the Latin Quarter, you know, were really disruptive. And as time went on, the emperors got you know more and more uh, antsy about it. And the thing is, uh, by in, during Manuel's reign, it got to the point where Manuel said, "Finally, this is enough. You know, I'm pro Western, but we can't deal with any with any of this anymore." So he he tried to basically banish the Italians from that quarter. Now it didn't actually work because they revolted. And, uh, and eventually they had to make concessions to these guys because there were so many of them and they were doing so much damage that they, they ended up getting their quarter back. And so they were, you know, back to stay. For, uh, they were really there to stay and they couldn't really be removed. Now, that action was probably not the most wise action because, uh, again, it, it kind of like undermined the... Uh, their viewpoint of the Italians that the Byzantines could actually keep them at bay. They kind of realized that they could do whatever the heck they wanted, and uh, the Byzantines couldn't do anything about it because they were busy doing other stuff. So by the end of Manuel's reign, it became quite dangerous, uh, especially considering the emperor now no longer really held the same prestige that he had at his, the accession of his reign because of his various losses. Uh, I guess the probably saw uh, Manuel as... You know, maybe even ineffective in some ways, and so that they felt that they could do something, uh, do whatever they wanted. So when Manuel died, uh, and Alexios II and his mother were on the throne, um, his mother, it, who was a Latin, herself. who was a who was a Latin, yes. Um, now the issue was that the Byz indigenous Byzantine people who lived in the city they hated they hated that they hated the fact that they were ruled by a Latin. They hated the fact that these Latins were causing disturbances in their in their glorious city, you know, the capital of Christendom, so to speak. And they felt that they needed to go, even though Manuel had tried to get rid of them, and they didn't. They couldn't get rid of them. So there was a lot of tension between the two, you know, the Latins and the, the Byzantines. And eventually it just came to all-out rebellion where, you know, the, the Latins were just out of control. Now, Alexios II and Maria Zena, they were they really were did a terrible job of managing these revolts. Um, there was only one attempt by the military uh, on the orders of the empress to actually do anything about this. And by the time it had happened, it was too late. What had happened was that the Byzantine people wanted a leader who was going to actually come in and get rid of these Latins once and for all. And who comes back but this black sheep of the family, Andronikos Komnenos, who was basically had left the, uh, the empire went to Muslim lands, had eloped with, you know, I think a lover or something like that, and uh, had basically come back because he realized that, you know, I think that he realized that all this trouble was going on and he, it was a prime era for him to take control of the throne. Yeah, you've, so, got, you've got a child on the throne, uh, his mother is hated and a foreigner, and there's a lot of unrest, and of course he is, you know, he is the, 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 the true Kalmanos coming back to take over. Yes, and so he came back uh, from Muslim lands. It's kind of shady as to exactly when he came back, but but somehow he came back, uh, got the support of the Byzantine people, got the support of what was you know 
whatever military forces he could, uh, and swiftly entered Constantinople and absolutely massacred the Latins, killed them all, killed all 10,000 of them in the Latin Quarter. And uh, that was, the, the Italian states were absolutely outraged. You know, all these Italian trade, you know, that, that basically destroyed any diplomatic relationship that those powers had with the Byzantines. Just to, just to ask, you know, because I, I think this is a, an interesting point here, is that was it his intention to go in and literally massacre all of these Italians who were living in uh, Constantinople at this time? Or was it more of something that it was intended to kind of drive them out? I mean, obviously he intended violence towards them, but uh, <laughs> was his intention to really just kill them all? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think the thing is that the sentiment of the Byzantines, they had been so, the people who were living in Constantinople, were they were so fed up with all of these, uh, with these Latins interfering in their lives. And of course, there's, of course, the religious differences, there were the cultural differences. And if you look at Byzantine history, for most of their history, they're very xenophobic. They really don't like people from outside the empire. Um, you know, the Komneni were really one of the first uh, groups of emperors that actually were interested in the West. And But the thing is, they, they kind of covered up that xenophobia that still existed in the empire. And I think it would have taken a very long time for that xenophobia to go away. Probably centuries, really. But the thing is, um, I think Andronicos, it's hard to say that whether he really intended that that massacre to occur, but I th I think it's also very hard to say that he he wouldn't have uh, he wouldn't have wanted it because if you look at his later the you know the rest of his reign it's very blood filled very violent very uh, just complete lack of regard for human life um, and I can just tell you that he was not a man of principle you can tell that because he re had renounced his he re had renounced his uh, his, um, you know, existence as a Byzantine once before he had, you know, gone to the Muslim lands, and uh, base, and he actually, I think he did it twice, if I'm not mistaken, and he he basically wasn't, he wasn't, uh, you, you know, he wasn't a proper Byzantine. He he didn't he didn't have the principles. He didn't have the uh, he was just a deranged madman, really, um, <laughs> who was who was driven by power, and so. Yeah. Yeah, so we have this this kind of uh, paradox of he's coming back in order to restore proper Byzantine rule over the city and drive out the non-Byzantine elements, while he himself is is very much an outsider and is sort of a non-Byzantine element itself. So mm -hmm. how was he received by the city? At first, he was loved because again, he had gotten he had finally solved the problem of the Latins, even though he had done it in such a terrible way. Yeah, they're kind they of were cutting gone. the Gordian knot. Yeah, yeah, they were gone. So, so people at first were like, "Yes, all these Latins are gone. Th you know, this is this is awesome." Unfortunately, uh, in the months that followed, they realized that, well, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Andronico started persecuting anyone who challenged his power, and uh, he ended up killing thousands and thousands of his own people. And he actually, by the end of his reign, and his reign only lasted two about two and a half years, uh, by the end of his reign. He had actually almost succeeded. <laughs> so this guy was, he was nuts. Absolutely nuts. Um, he also married a 11-year-old, uh, the 11-year-old um, betrothed to Alexios II, and uh, apparently consummated his marriage with her too. So this guy was, so. he, had, he had no principle at all. Absolutely none. And uh, that's why he's called the black sheep of the Komnenos family, because this family had such a long history of pragmatic, sensible, um, accepting rule. And yet you get this guy who is just just completely off the wall. And I and you know, he only lasted two and a half years and then he was deposed. And uh, I'll actually tell you how he was deposed. Um, once he had tried to he I think he tried to arrest one of the Angelos um, family, who was one of the prominent families in the uh, in the city. And um, when I think uh, his uh, his agent had tried to arrest uh, arrest this guy. Um, I think it was Isaac Angelos. When he tried to arrest him, uh, the uh, Isaac Angelos killed him. He killed the the agent, and so this uh, and then he fled, and that's what um, allowed 
the, that was basically the cause by yeah, which yeah. Uh, when you have a, a, a an insane murderous uh, oppressive emperor and you kill his person who's come to arrest you, mm-hmm. your 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 options there are very limited. Yes, but but fortunately that the Angeloi family was um, relatively uh, powerful. So what they what they did was they were able to raise the support of, of the people because obviously they hated they hated the fact that Angelicos was killing everyone off. You know he was he descended into madness, and uh, and so they they marched against him. They deposed him, and uh, he met a very very uh, grisly end um, by at the hands of the people. Actually, kind of like in the way Mussolini died. Uh, they. Um, they basically dragged him out to the streets. They, uh, there's actually there's a famous quote where it says the they um, they tried to a couple of the soldiers tried to see how far they could stick their swords into his body, and then um, then they ripped him apart, literally pulled his his arms and legs right off, and then dumped his body into the into the water. I think afterwards. So that was the end of Andronicos, um, and that is the end of the Komneni dynasty, at least at least in Constantinople as, as Byzantine emperors. So there you go. That so, is the grisly end of the Komnenos dynasty. <laughs> well, so just to kind of put an epilogue on this, what is the legacy of the Komnenians? And, you know, how are they seen in history? I think, for, at least for me and how I, you know, what I've seen from most scholars, uh, there is a very positive viewpoint of the Komnenian emperors. Um, they started with an empire that was on death's doorstep and brought it back from the brink to become really the superpower of the Mediterranean again. In many ways, I think you can see the Komnenian period as the last golden age of Byzantium because um, even though we talked a lot about the military aspect of the Komnenian emperors, and even though they are seen very much as military emperors, there is a lot of cultural and even scientific development that occurred under their reign. For example, um, if you read through uh, Anna Komnena's Alexiad, you'll find a lot of interesting references to uh, not only Anna's erudition, but also to the, I guess, the level of sophistication of even Alexios's understanding of things. For example, they obviously knew uh, a lot about um, astronomy, because they go through a lot of explanations of comets and stars and various things like that. You also find Anna goes on a rant herself about how astrology is this false thing that people shouldn't have faith in, uh, that they should believe more in, in more like things that are pragmatic and, and evidenced, which is, I think, a viewpoint that she got from her, her mentor, "Quote unquote mentor Michael Sellos. Now it's never been proven whether he actually lived long enough to, to, um, to actually teach her anything, but it is possible that he did because we don't know what happened to him after 1078. Apparently there is a document that does list him as being still alive in 1095, which would mean that he was still, you know, he he was able to teach Anna when she was young. But it seems that Anna and and Michael Sellos." Uh, and Michael Sellis, of course, is a uh, famous um, uh, philosopher of the really uh, and his successors. Um, he he and Anna have very similar viewpoints, especially when it comes to uh, philosophy and science. And so you'll see that there there are clear parallels that exist between them. And it it does not surprise it would not surprise me in the bit if he was indeed her her mentor because they're, they're just very similar. And they're also considered generally the great philosophers of the empire. But it's during this period, again, that you see this rise of, of a lot of in, very developed um, intellectualism. Even like You could even go so far as to make the argument that the origins of the scientific method started during this period because there's a shift from this mysticism, uh, the, the like theological uh, or religious reasons for why things are, to more of a, an understanding that there are natural causes for these things. Anna Komnena actually even states that directly in her book. She says that Alexios believed that things rose from a natural, things like comets and things arose from natural causes. So you see a very interesting intellectual development during this era. And um, again, there's actually even evidence that heliocentrism was uh, at least promoted by some of the intellectuals of the period. You'll see uh, that in the works of John Italos. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting period. 
Well, Ember, thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge of this period with us. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's it's interesting that even though we've we've talked for so long and covered so much, it, really any any slice that we could have gone over could have been, a, you know, a lengthy episode in and of itself. So thank you for covering what is probably, a, a, as far as, I mean, I certainly find it now at least one of the most fascinating periods of Byzantine history and probably one of the most overlooked I would say periods of Western history at all, considering how how neglected the Byzantines are. So, thank you again. Oh, anytime. Uh, I had a great, I enjoyed it very greatly. Um, one thing I did want to comment on is uh, I, I didn't get to say anything about after um, Andronicus, there was um, an extension of the Comnenian family that did survive, and it survived in Trebizond, which um, you know lasted all the way until 1461. When it was captured, so they they called themselves the Megas Komnenoi, so or Megas Komneni. So so they they are very um, also interesting. If anyone wants to look into the continuation of the Komnenos family, they did live on in in Trebizond. So that yeah. that's something also to keep in mind. We can put uh, some some links to that up in the uh, show notes when we put the discussion post up, as well as I believe you're uh, you're gonna <laughs> sort out some of these names for us, and also put some pictures up of that uh, the the armor that you had been jingling in the background earlier. Sure, yeah. sure, I definitely will. Um, yep, so I, I definitely will do that, and I'll post up some of my other stuff too because I have a, I have a paramary on. We didn't really get to talk about a lot of the military equipment, but I would have loved to even do a, a separate podcast on that. So. <laughs> So yeah, um, I'll definitely post up some more information, give you some ideas of uh, what the Byzantine army might have looked like during that period. Um, so I would definitely be more than happy to do that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And there you have the Macedonian and Comnenian dynasties. I, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, we'll have the discussion post up so you can ask any follow-up questions. We had a bit of a um, uh, some unforeseen circumstances which prevented being those being answered, but hopefully we can uh, get some of those uh, past questions and any current or pending questions you might have addressed. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I hope you'll come back uh, in another two weeks. Uh, we'll be, uh, you know, these have been some of our longer episodes, so we'll actually have uh, an episode that will be you know, positively bite-sized in comparison uh, in two weeks. I'll be talking to Elmac about the Principality of Baldonia. Uh, which is a tiny, uh, it's a micronation that was basically just kind of uh, dreamed up almost on a lark by a, an American businessman in the 1940s when he bought an island off uh, Newfoundland. So uh, it's it's an interesting little story, uh, and uh, El Mac and I talk a little bit about you know kind of the nature and place of micronations in the, the modern world as well. So uh, I hope you come back and listen to that. Uh, and uh, you know, in the meantime, of course, uh, feel free to rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, that does, of course, some sort of black magic, which makes uh, all things better for us. Uh, you can also uh, check out the, the Libsyn page where you have all our past uh, episodes archived there. Uh, and then if you, you know, listen to us through any other kind of streaming service, uh, please feel free to rate and review us on that as well, if it, if it allows. Um, so until then, you've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.